recording. And I'll let a few more students in. So hi, everybody. I'm really uh, excited to welcome our guest for this week in this series of 12 speakers addressing racism and inequities in classical music and orchestras. Uh, Aaron Flagg is uh, the chair of jazz studies at Juilliard. Uh, and more importantly, he has been heading up the effort to address this uh, uh, issue of racism in orchestra uh, as a, um, a board member of the League of American Orchestras. And he was uh, instrumental this summer in um, forming uh, the statement uh, that was um, uh, uh, put together with a committee of members of uh, various um, participants from the field by the League of American Orchestras. I've shared the link to that um, uh, as a required reading for this uh, session, as well as his uh, recent article in the Symphony Magazine. Uh, so we're going to jump right into the uh, questions, but uh, let me just give you a little bit of the format uh, of how it will be. Uh, there'll be five topic areas. We'll uh, uh, sort of uh, we'll group the questions that you have submitted so far. Uh, the per uh, his personal journey, the article, the league statement, audition process, what can we do? So uh, as we go through each of the sections, uh, we'll ask you to um, ask additional questions or ad additional uh, discussions as necessary. Um, but without further ado, uh, uh, let us all welcome uh, uh, Aaron Fleck. Oh, and please, everybody, put your um, uh, videos on so he can really see you. Um, so Jay, Francis, Sean, uh, Christine, Danielle, Roosevelt, uh, just uh, uh, beautiful, lovely faces so uh, Mr. Flack can interact with you. Welcome, Mr. Flack. Thank you so much, Professor Kim. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, it's been so amazing for me to watch some of the videos you guys have, been, or videos of you all were interacting with your prior guests. Um, it is, I, I can't tell you how excited I am for you how excited I am for the field and how amazing those conversations are. And I know you, you have them, so they're part of your experience, but uh, this, this wasn't happening when I was in school. Uh, you know, the Professor Kim and I went to, to school, uh, one of our schools together. And so it's a great connection. And I'm gonna articulate something one of my teachers have told me. The people that you are interacting with now are not just for now. They're not just because we're all in this class together, what have you. This is your generation. These are your people. You will interact with them in ways you can't even imagine um, now. And so, uh, you know, revel in that, the experiences you've had and talking to some of the guests that you've had and some that are coming, it's just incredible. I, I am I'm excited for you and for our field. And I'm really excited to get into your questions. Um, so let's let's do that right away. As, as uh, Professor Kim mentioned, I proposed a structure that's five areas. I'll start with the questions that I perceive to be around my personal journey. And at the end of addressing the written questions, I'm going to say anything else on this area. And that is your cue to say, hey, I got a question. Why are you wearing that blue shirt or whatever you want? To <laughs> um, that's that would be great. All right. So. Um, Christine, uh, where's Christine said, who asked this first question? I want to honor Christine. Where is she? Hey, Wave Christine. your hand. Where are you? Wave your hand, Christine. I can't see you. Uh, my camera. Oh, there you are. My Wi-Fi is really bad. Okay. We love you no, no matter what. It's fine. <laughs> I just wanted to, to honor you because you were clearly the first one out of the gate. So bravo to you at 7.41 p.m. on September <laughs> Um, but you asked about, and several of your colleagues, Irene and uh, 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 Katarina and Jehun asked about basically struggles. Um, and your question was what action that I've taken or helped to promote do I feel has the most and the greatest impact? Um, my immediate reaction to reading that was today, tomorrow, um, every day. I have no idea what my impact is. I'll find that out when I die, uh, or you'll find that out after I'm dead. So my only goal is to try to make a positive impact now and in, in, in every moment. Um, and as far as the issues that we're talking about in this conversation around um, bringing all this wonderful music that we all love so much to more people, uh, that, and how can we make that happen? My uh, impact or what I think I, I do that helps that happen is, you know, in my day job and all my volunteer work and governance work is uh, I hire people, people, I fire people. 
I select people and, and I uh, invest my time and resources in, in areas that I hope will have impact. Um, but in terms of, of what specific thing I, I've done, I, I'm just about every day. I'm not really thinking in terms of that. Uh, Irene asked, what are my goals and motivations and how do, how do I overcome obstacles uh, in the process of striving toward those goals, which is a great question for all of us. For me, I have a life vision just for myself, which I figured out at, at 18. I said, my life is gonna be about bringing people and the arts together. I don't know how that'll happen, all the ways that are happen, but that is why I'm here on the earth. Of course, my son would ask, well, wait a minute, what about me? Okay, well, he's important too, but <laughs> in terms of life, life work, that, that's what I'm about, the arts and bringing people together. Um, and I think in terms of what does it take to help enable you to overcome barriers um, is a deep clarity around right and wrong, um, understanding of what you can control and what you can't, because that second one is important. If you don't understand that, frustration will be your friend. So understanding what you can control and what you can't. And then for me, history, understanding paths that others have gone through. Uh, and understanding what that, that means about human beings, myself and others included. So the more I understand the human condition and how selfish and spoiled and greedy I am and, and take that into the work that I'm doing, then when I face something, I actually don't think of it as, as an obstacle. Um, there's a book by um, Stephen Covey called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And one of the first, I think the first one is seek first to understand then to be understood. Seek first to understand, then to be understood. So when I come across what I guess you would call a barrier, my first thought is like, okay, what motivates this person? Why are they acting this way? There must be a reason. I assume they're a good person, they mean well. They're not trying, they're not consciously trying to discriminate against me or, or not help the student or not move this cause forward or uh, so, so what's going on? Well, what's the reason? And the more I can understand what's behind their experience that led them to think this way um, or anything, else, then it's much easier for me to figure out a way to, to work with them. And, and so I don't think of it as an obstacle. I just think of it as another opportunity to learn and to pause and to slow my roll and go, okay, I know where I'm going. I know what we're going to do. The challenge is how can I engage this person or this institution in a way that'll help us get there? And to do that, I have to understand what motivates them. Does that, hopefully that makes some sense. And if it doesn't, please tell me. Um, and then uh, uh, Katarina asked, um, though I you know, basically, what has been the most difficult thing you've encountered along this path towards social change? Um, the di most difficult thing is me. My own embrace of racist, sexist ideology. The painful looking in the mirror and realizing like, wait a minute, I actually on some level, which I was not conscious until now, this moment, I have embraced the idea that this race, this type of person is better than any other type of person. And that is manifest in this way. Wow, I've got to change that. I've got to address that. So that's the most, um, that's the most difficult thing because it's embarrassing. Who likes to admit that they are wrong? <laughs> Who likes to admit that they don't know something that, gee, I always thought these types of people, what do you mean these types of people? Oh yeah, why did I say that? Why did, well, this group, of, well, what are these people called? What do they call themselves? Oh gee, I don't know, I have to ask, I have to learn. So that internal uh, humility, um, is, is my biggest challenge, but it's also my biz, biggest benefit because I know what that feels like now. <laughs> I know what it feels like every day to be like, gee, what did I say that hurt that person? Or gee, why, help me understand this. So then when I go to do lectures or presentations or writing, I'm thinking about the reader. And I'm thinking what, what barriers are they going to just, because it's, it's ingrained in us. We all were brought up in this system you know, to think a certain way. 
Um, so the more I understand that in myself, the more I can be empathetic, truly empathetic, and understand that in others. Um, uh, and then uh, Jehuan asks, any difficulties you've encountered along this path? Once I figured uh, the internal stuff out in terms of direction, what I believe in, when I, once I got over like many years not wanting to do this work, uh, this work meaning uh, talk about race. I'm a trumpet player. I just want to play. <laughs> I just want to play Mahler. I want to play, uh, you know, Brandenburg too. I just, that's all I want to do is play. I don't want to talk about the color of my skin. I don't want to talk about being from South Central LA and dealing, you know, what that meant growing up and blah, blah. I don't want to talk about that. I just want to be seen as a trumpet player. And it took a long time for me to say, how do you see yourself? And I said, I'm a trumpet player. I play anything that says trumpet in the upper left-hand corner. Great. As soon as I embraced that, I accepted that, then it was okay to look at other things. You are more than just a trumpet player. You're on this recording. You've toured around the world. You're okay, great. Now you're also uh, a religious person. You're also a parent. You're also uh, an educate, someone who's educated about race and about this music. Might you want to share that? Yes, I, I need to share it because nobody else seems to be doing it as much as I think they should. So I got to do it. And now I want to do it. Now I embrace that. But it took a long time. It, look, it took too long, frankly, because the system said, don't stick out. You know, try to get along with the white culture. Don't make them upset. Make them happy. And when, if you're brought up with that, you don't realize that it's a load until the load comes off. Then you go, oh my gosh, I've been carrying all of that. Man, why can't I just be myself all the time? So those are the, that's the type of journey I've had to go through to embrace um, wholeheartedly doing this work. Um, but I think that journey has helped me, um, I'd like to think <laughs> that it's helped me understand what it feels like for anyone else to be asked to go on this journey. It is, it is a not easy thing to do. And society is saying, why should you do this? You don't need to do this. You know, you're privileged. You don't have to think about this. So it, it, it's an act of bravery. It's also an act of great generosity for any of us to spend time thinking about this, in, in my opinion, and trying to help the systems and the individuals in the system see what's going on and want to address it. It's like the movie, The Matrix. I don't know about y'all, I love The Matrix. So I hope you, if you haven't seen it, you gotta see it. You know, <laughs> the red pill, the blue pill, like realizing what system you're actually in is a shocking thing. And I understand why people don't, uh, but our job is to over time, over my life, this is what I'm gonna be doing. So, all right, that addresses quickly the questions on my personal journey, but if there are other, spontaneous questions that have come up, happy to hear them. Come on, I don't bite. I'm all right. I'm a nice guy. No questions about that? Question. Danielle. Yes, Danielle. Um, yeah, so you were saying that when you were 18, you kind of knew what you wanted to do with the rest of your life. Would you say that it was always something on your mind that you knew you wanted to like really pursue or was there like a specific like I don't know, Eureka moment where you said like, okay, that's it. This is what I'm going to do. So, so going, there are several things in what you just said. Going to do, I didn't know what I was going to do actually. I wouldn't, had no idea what, what would happen to my life at 18. In fact, I remember making a list. My mother found it and sent it to me when I was my first year at Juilliard as a college student. But I had written at 16, a list of things I wanted to do before 30. Now you have to understand where I grew up. I grew up in a gang infested area in, in LA. So, uh, anyway, in LA. And the idea of living to 30 uh, didn't make sense to me. Like you couldn't live past 30 was the thought because I just saw a lot of people killed. So that was the vibe. So I thought, okay, what, what do I want to do by 30? And I made this kind of wild list. At the time it felt like, you know, pfft, do this. And, and my mother sent it to me, she found it and sent it to me. And it said things like, I wanna travel out of the state of California. I wanna make $20,000 in a year. I wanna be able to play this piece of music. 
And, and when I saw that list, it was my, no, my, yeah, second year at Juilliard, uh, I had already achieved everything on that list. And what that told me was like, wow, man, I have to make a better list next time. I, like, and it also showed me the level of, of what my thinking was at the time. Um, so at 18, what I knew at home was I wanted to play the trumpet. Like, that's, what, that's the puzzle I am lifelong fascinated to solve how to play this piece of metal. And that was it. I didn't think about, I want to be in an orchestra or play jazz or record. All I knew is I want to play the trumpet. And my parents were like, you like to eat. Like, so how are you going to do that doing? Like, we don't know anybody who does that. You know, like, what, what does that mean? I said, I don't know. I just want to play the trumpet. Maurice Andre, baby. You know, that's what I want to do. I want to play the trumpet. But, so it was very childlike in many, many ways. But it was also very, uh, very clear. And I assumed everybody knew that. <laughs> like, oh, everybody must have, I want to be a scientist. Okay, great. So it took me a long time to realize that that's not true. That not everybody knows at the core of their being what is the puzzle they want to work on solving for their life. Um, I don't know if I, Danielle, did I answer your question? I hope. Okay. All right. Um, you. Sure. you know, one of the, one of the themes that, um, I think many of our students face, uh, in their first, second, third year at Cornell is actually, uh, finding what it is that their path will be. Right. And I think sometimes, um, students I've seen too many times, uh, enter Cornell with sort of their five years out, like already mapped out. Right. So in, in, in that sense, they haven't really given thought to who they are, what makes them tick. So I, I constantly advise students to, hey, uh, before you sign on to this sort of uh, knowing what you're going to take every semester at Cornell, uh, make room, make so that there is room for you to explore into areas uh, that, that is unknown, that is uncomfortable, so that you find out who you are rather than sort of assuming that you're this person. Because I've seen too many times where people go through their entire studies of, of, at Cornell, thinking they're this one person, or this is the path, not really exploring any and any other uh, ways of being. So mm -hmm. I, I think, um, you know, liberal arts education is supposed to be where you you find what your path is. Uh, right. No, that's great. That's great. And, that, and I think that's true. Um, uh, the idea of, of remaining open, although I knew I wanted to play trumpet. Definitely. I, that wasn't connected to money. That wasn't connected to a job. That, and my parents always are like, okay, Trump, great. What, how are your grades? You know, you got to get out of the, uh, we got to get you out of here. You know, you got to get out. And I got scholarships for, I mean, all kinds of crazy degrees in engineering and stuff. I was like, what? Well, your SAT scores are so high. I said, I want to play the trumpet. What about my trumpet playing? <laughs> my parents were like, man, you got Northwestern, all these schools are calling. Cause man, why don't you do that? And I was just so focused on, do they have a good trumpet teacher? <laughs> Can we play the trumpet? Like they were just like, oh. so after a while it was like, okay, whatever, you know, at least you have good grades. That's all they, they cared about. You're a nice kid. You have good grades. You're not on drugs or in trouble. Fine. And so in a way they gave me freedom to kind of figure stuff out uh, and get committed to it. All right. So without further ado, we'll move on to the questions about the article. Um, there are a lot of questions about this article. So I'm gonna try to uh, rapid fire in, in a way. And if, if you feel disrespected at all, please cut me off and say, give me a better answer to my question. I'll, <laughs> I'll do my best to do that. All right, so um, one question was Alex's question. Um, where's Alex? Uh, Thomas, Alex Thomas. Hello. Sorry, my mic was muted. Oh, there's Alex. Thanks for your question, man. Um, so you asked about uh, segregated musicians unions and were there any notable pushes for the unions to merge prior to the federal government's mandate in 1967? Um, I understand your point that it, it, it would seem logical that having multiple unions in a city that the musicians would start to say, hey, we'll be in a better situation if we actually you know, combine our efforts and negotiate it for wages that are fixed for all of us, right? Yeah. Uh, that's a beautiful vision, um, but that's not what was happening. 
in the in the 50s and 60s. Um, as you saw from the slideshow, that was pretty, a little bit. Some of those those people are well, good friends of mine, the later ones. But my, my heroes, Donald White was one of the first cellists, first cellists hired by the Cleveland Orchestra in 1957 full time. The things they were thinking about in 1957 with, with Mr. White had to do with uh, making sure he signed up for the right union because you had to be in the right union because the, the union, the quote, right union was connected to the right job. So in Cleveland, there was a very big uh, commercial music scene in the, in the 50s, uh, in hotel gigs and all types of different commercial gigs. And the black union really had a, 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 a lock on all of those jobs and black players played in those jobs. So the funny thing, well, funny to me, but he was in Hartford, he won the gig, left the Hartford Symphony to go to Cleveland. He just started to sign up for the Black Union because he just assumed that's where I should be. Well, it took, that was a problem because all the symphony musicians were in the White Union. And so there was a big concern to get him out of the Black Union, get him in, try to get him into the White Union. And so, although your idea um, very much makes sense, Alex, that's not what they were thinking about. And so as is often the case in systems, um, we call it in business theory, uh, theory, the burning platform. Sometimes people do not move until the thing they're standing on is on fire and they are forced to move. Um, so no, there weren't any major changes to it until they were forced to do it. People get comfortable in their, their environments. Okay, that's not a rapid fire answer. And then you said, aside from the Rooney Rule and grant programs, what other ways can we use policy to increase diversity in orchestra? My immediate reaction was hire them. And hire what, them. I, what I meant more by that is like, how do we like get orchestras to hire these people without like almost tokenizing them? Because I feel like that could become an issue. So a, a way to get anybody to do it, something is to hopefully make an effective presentation to them. I think you should eat Brussels sprouts because it'll be good for your eyes and your skin development and it's so tasty and blah, blah. You make, try to make an effective presentation. And um, I think there's a lot of value to that. And the work we're doing in the league, and I'll get to that later, I think is trying to do that. Um, I'm glad Sage likes the vegetable Brussels sprouts. Um, <laughs> But also it's about, sometimes you just have to force people to do stuff they're not thinking to do. And force can come from embarrassment. Force can come from publicity, social media campaigns. Um, you know, people don't, it's a, it's a human thing. I mean, how many times have your parents asked you to do something and you just have not done it? They've asked you nicely, they said, oh, please. They bring it up all the time. And you find some creative way to ignore it, procrastinate on it, say, yeah, yeah, sure, I hear you. Roll your eyes. You don't do it, right? I mean, if you're like me, that's what I do. So institutions are the same way. So your question, at this point in history, to me, I immediately go to hire them. Just hire them now. And, and the issue, the reason I say now is because there are qualified musicians and administrators and board members of various colors and backgrounds available right now. Right now, I just got uh, last week, uh, colleague, uh, two weeks ago or so, a colleague of mine in uh, an orchestra to be a name, good buddy of mine, saw a post I wrote and said, you know, we're trying to hire people here. There's just nobody to play who can, you know, we know of. And I sent him immediately five names, like within, 15 minutes. Here are five names, five email addresses. They can all play. And if I can do that in five minutes, I, I don't want to hear that 80 people in your orchestra can't find somebody. That's crazy. You know, there's a whole orchestra of Black students at Juilliard now. In fact, there's three trumpet players killing. Could play any job today. And so when I hear, oh, we don't know where they are, I mean, come on, you know. You don't want to know. And so, but anyway, that's a long way to answer that question. Uh, Jonah asked, um, 
to that, do you think that this facet of the issue and that facet being the lack of diversity on boards needs to be resolved first? That is to increase BIPOC membership in orchestras. Should orchestras first focus on diversifying their boards? Great question. Um, uh, I think it's an and, not an or strategy. Uh, there's no need to wait, do all of it. <laughs> and and uh, whatever moves first, great. Um, I was on the board of the Stanford Symphony Orchestra for several years, got several soloists to play with that orchestra, paid a lot of money for various events. And um, the orchestra, I was on the search committee for the conductor, for the new ED, and in my own way, tried to say, hey, there are three women conductors who are in our pool. They're amazing. These female conductors happen to be women conductors, great, young, full of energy. And, and it was like, sure, no. And I was like, okay, we're going for the most conservative, oldest white man, again, to be the conductor. All right. And then this uh, situation took off this spring with, you know, in the killing of George Floyd. And there was a moment for me when I saw what that orchestra came up with as a statement. And in that moment, I had a decision to make. Is this still worth my time? Can we make movement in this organization? Yes or no? And, and I love the people. I mean, we have dinner together. I've gone, you know, all types of, they're all cool. We love the music. Different, it's great. I learned a lot, different things. But at the end, I went, no, absolutely not. So I called and said, I'm resigning immediately. Done. So yes, we need to bring more diversity on the board. Yes, we need to bring it here, but uh, there has to be a sense of urgency and a willingness and that is in, in essence is, is gonna come from you guys. Because it, the reason I say that is you're, you're going to be much more aware, even aware of these issues, even these different perspectives than uh, people 10 years older than you are. And so you're gonna be in a position, you're gonna get asked a question one day, oh, you played in an orchestra, what do you think of this? And just the way you respond to that It'll be natural to you, but in some ways it'll seem progressive to the person you're talking to. Uh, as I read all the research for all the, that article and a bunch of other things, I was amazed by not just the facts, but how people talked about things 50 years ago. The things that they would just say that you and I would be hor horrified by. <laughs> like what, They just said that like that, that's, that's horrible. But that's what the culture was. So the culture has to change. It, it has to be no longer acceptable. Somebody has to speak up and say, why are there only white people in this room? Why are you comfortable with one black board member for eight years? Well, uh, why are you? And then I had to ask myself, why am I comfortable with that? I'm still sitting here. <laughs> and I have to say, well, I'm not sitting here anymore. Times have changed. So I think it needs to be for everybody on every level, but we have to have somebody there who, who knocks the, on the psychological door and says, why are we not hiring this woman? She's amazing. What is wrong with you people? Help me understand that. And, and frankly, there are not enough people to even ask that question, to even think that in those rooms, let alone say it and feel secure enough to say it, you know? So it's, it's, um, it's very easy for all of us. I'm not blaming my colleagues on Stanford. I still love them. I was gonna call one today because I just like talking to the people, but it's easy for us to accept things unless we're corrected. I remember we were doing a programming meeting in that symphony and we were, well, what American music can we do? The conductor was generous enough to even have that type of conversation with the board, which I thought was amazing at the time. And so I said, well, what about some Copeland? You know, it'd be nice to pair some Copeland with it. And someone, three people on the board said, I don't know if Copeland will sell. I don't know, do people really know Copeland? I said, well, what other American composer <laughs> do you think they might know? You know, maybe I, something I don't know. They, they, well, I don't know. It seemed more like a Hinastera type of, of like, wow. 
So to actually have the audacity to express that much ignorance in public to people who have doctorates in music, I thought to myself, like, that's fascinating that this person would say that to me and in front of everyone. Like, why, why, what, what, what's the, why would that happen? You know? And I think it's just because nobody's in the room to say, uh, that's a problem. So I think a long answer, sorry, um, to that question, it has to be uh, both. It's an and strategy. Matthew Chin asked a question about, um, oh yes, Asian Pacific Islander representation has increased at a higher rate than that for other minorities. Why is this so? And what can we learn from this uh, phenomenon that might be applied to other minorities? I think that's a great question. It's a reasonable question. Um, uh, the, the real issue though is, I don't know what the phenomena is. The question is why have Asian and Pacific Islanders increased over, since 1970 in their in, in membership in orchestras? What are the factors to that? Um, I'm gonna ask you all, what do you all think? I'm tired of hearing my voice. Somebody unmute and give me an idea. Why do you think that is? I'm going, nobody, no one well, has I mean, I, in March, I keep telling my students in March, I was, um, I called in to run a rehearsal for a, a colleague of mine with the Pacific Youth Symphony in Orange County. And uh, when I stepped up on the podium, uh, you know, I always ask for a roster of the orchestra so I can say, hey, uh, Jennifer, uh, rather than, hey, second flute, because I like to uh, address the people I'm rehearsing. And then, of course, the roster was 99% Asian American. Uh, so, um, and I, I didn't expect that. I mean, yes, Orange County is very, a lot of Asian Americans in Orange County. Uh, but uh, just anecdotally, uh, I went to pre-college Juilliard, and I think it was like 80, 85% Asian American uh, when I went to pre-college Juilliard. Uh, I played in the New York Youth Symphony. Uh, large number of Asian students. Chicago Youth, uh, a friend of mine conducts large number of uh, Asian Americans. So I think in the... Uh, the flagship youth orchestra systems, uh, there's a lot of students being involved uh, in, in music. I think it, it's no accident that the Suzuki violin method, the cello method, uh, you know, uh, it was uh, in, engineered and designed by uh, a, a Japanese educator, music educator. So I think in terms of education uh, for Asians, for Asians, Asian Americans, um, there is a lot of things happening where there isn't a social stigma of playing a classical music, classical instrument. Whereas uh, there is social stigma uh, where uh, if, um, as Aaron, Dor Aaron Dorkin describes his childhood uh, growing up in a, in a biracial family, he would, he would be playing the violin and that's how he defined himself. And then his friends would say, that, you're not black because that's a, that's, a, that's a white thing. So I, I think there, there is cultural things that is sort of pushing, um, uh, the, the encouraging or discouraging the kind of uh, education musically uh, um, young young people get so that that's sort of one small piece of the answer um, mm -hmm. I think there is disproportionate uh, way uh, even in our Ithaca school district, district system um, certain uh, young children are encouraged to be part of Suzuki programs and school music programs and then certain students uh, are turned away from uh, cluster music instruments or from string instruments. Right. So that history in America, and when you say, as you all know better than I, that when we say Asian uh, Pacific Islanders, I immediately think of the, the vast diversity under that title. You have uh, Asian people who immigrate to America. You have those who are, you know, uh, born here. And just the cultural difference right there is, is extreme. Typically in, in any immigrant group, uh, be it uh, immigrants from China uh, uh, or Korea or from Haiti, um, immigrants who would come to America to study music or, you know, th they're typically in a higher socioeconomic bracket. There's the immigrant drive to succeed. If any of you have seen Hamilton, the musical, you know that that was also played out uh, as well in that uh, biopic, so to speak. Um, so, the, the immigrant experience, no matter what country you come from, 
immigrating to America to build a family. And there's a whole different mindset in many cases than a native America, a native born person. And so there's also, you know, I think of when I first read that question, I thought, thought of the Chinese cultural revolution and what happened under, in China under Mao Zedong uh, from 1966 to the seventies, where it was kind of get rid of Western culture. You know, it's about communism. And so we need to purge the country of this repugnant capitalistic Western culture, which meant that there were violent destruction of music, you know, records, instruments. You cannot play this Western stuff. Well, if you had been brought up in China in the 50s, passionate about Tchaikovsky and really engaged in it, and then as a teenager or so, you saw it taken away. What's going to happen to you in the late 70s, yeah, early 80s, when it finally is dissipated and those barriers are removed? That's a question for you to answer, anyone. Uh, Rebecca Kim, what would, what would you think would happen in a situation like that? Oh, we can't hear you, Rebecca. Uh, maybe you can type in the uh, your thoughts to that question, Rebecca. I'm so sorry, we can't quite hear you. Um, but maybe I can ask uh, Ella, Ella White, what do you think would happen to a human under that situation? You love something and then there's a 12, 18 year uh, part of your life where it is violently removed from you and then the doors open up where you can actually partake of it again. Ella White, what would happen? I feel like it's possible that you just get like upset enough that you would start to hate it in order to like mentally be okay with the fact that it was like ripped away from you. So you like, I, I feel like if I was in that situation, I would be hesitant to start doing it again, just out of fear that it would be taken away again. Mm. Especially if you stayed in that very same country. Yeah, definitely. What about if you had the opportunity to leave the country and go to a place that was considered a home of that culture that you have embraced? I'm not sure. I think I would be hesitant. Like I would start doing it again slowly, but I would be hesitant. Okay, understood. So um, that's definitely a valid response to that type of trauma. Uh, what has definitely happened is that there have been many uh, artists who, and parents of future artists, once that wall was lifted, so to speak, um, there was a desire to share this treasure with their grandchild or their, their, you know, now you're free to learn this violin. It's such an amazing thing. There was a, an urgency, a joy, an excitement about it. Um, just the fact that both reactions can exist. Yeah, and I think Ella makes a really great point. Um, is, is, is an underpinning that did not exist in America for most black and brown people. Yeah, we were excluded. <laughs> it was it, teachers, even if you had talent said, you should not do this. The great tenor saxophonist Coleman Hawkins who revolutionized that instrument from a circus kind of squawky instrument to a melodic uh, solo instrument was a cellist. And he was a wonderful cellist. He played the Bach cello suites and his teacher said, you're really good, but you will never be allowed to play in an orchestra. You were only meant to you know, play in schools, school band or school orchestra and that's it. And so because his teacher, the culture said, this is the ceiling for you. He switched and brought all that counterpunctal knowledge and harmonic knowledge to the saxophone. And if you ever have a chance, you guys should listen to his most famous piece called his rendition in 1932 of Body and Soul. You will immediately hear the cello <laughs> and in this virtuosic rendition of Body and Soul. Um, so he obviously found a way to continue expressing, but the culture was not one of go get this cherished classical music. It just that was not the case. So I don't know if that's the only reason, uh, back to Matthew's question for the difference, but, and, and more importantly, you were like, what, how can we apply this to other groups to whom we wanna share this great music with? I think one aspect is to not underestimate the importance of culture 
that the society needs to accept this. And what just popped in my mind is Black Panther, the movie. Imagine the, I hope you all saw the movie. It's a great movie, just an exciting Marvel movie. But the impact on, um, in, in my community is, is, is hard to overstate. The idea of seeing a primarily black cast focus on a black, even fictional, homeland. And that, that homeland is thriving. And the homeland is thinking about helping the rest of the world with its resources. And that it, the, the leads and all of that is just like, like mind blowing. And not something sad to say that our culture was expecting, or I'll put it more directly, when Barack Obama was uh, uh, sworn in in his inauguration, I was the executive director of a large music conservatory. And I asked uh, the staff to take the day off. And one of my colleagues invited us all to her home to watch the inaugura inauguration. And so I sat down in her living room at, with 30 people. And when he raised his hand to take the oath, it, it was in that moment that I realized I'd never dreamed of this. It never entered my mind ever to work toward or plan or hope for or speak about a black president. It was so far-fetched, my parents never talked about it. It was never a dream. I didn't believe he would ever win. I assumed he would be shot. So realizing all of this, when he raised his hand, I started crying. I had to leave the room because not, not just out of joy of, and not to get into politics, you could disagree with his, you know, whatever he did, but it wasn't about that. It was that I realized as an educated man who was the executive director of this organization, this is my staff, that I hadn't thought that far. I hadn't dreamed that far. I didn't even have it as a dream. What a horrible re revelation. So I think for a people, any group of people, putting it in the culture as a possibility repeatedly, you know, this is, this is valid. Much like Ellen DeGeneres when she came out that I was just like, yes, first, you know, that's the first step toward making uh, this lifestyle normalized. It's okay to love. Um, so I think um, that needs to happen in all cultures to as one step toward the success uh, seen in the Asian and Asian Pacific world. But I would also add, or else my Asian friends would be really upset with me, that some there's a price for that so-called success. And a price for that so-called success has been to be invisible, to be the preferred minority, to just be, well, the white people will accept an Asian because they're, you know, docile and they'll get along and they'll fit in and they'll, 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 they'll. That has been a cost of, in some people's lives and careers of, of, of that quote unquote success. Um, so how we change the culture is a big thing. Um, all right, uh, Ella, who was just, I just talked to, she said, why do you think the New York Philharmonic and the general public drew so little attention to the first Af African-American orchestral player. So Sanford Allen, who was in the picture at the beginning as the first, um, I think, Ella, you might be referencing the board minutes that I put in the article, is that correct? I believe so. Okay, so in the board minutes of the New York Philharmonic, um, it was indicated the, uh, the fact that um, well, actually, that was Elaine Jones, the fact that she had played and that there wasn't any, they noted in the minutes, there was no outburst or there was no notice. Um, so you may not have been referring to that exactly, but the, the thing I, I thought when I read your question is the purpose for them to say that about Elaine Jones had many different things. They were, so they were happy that there wasn't a revolt, that a Black woman was playing timpani with the near Philharmonic. They were also... Uh, surprised that they didn't get credit and there wasn't, you know, outpouring of how wonderful you white people have let this black woman play timpani. Um, and so there was, it was many things happening inside that, that, that comment. Um, but as far as Sanford, knowing Sanford Allen well uh, and playing with him, there, there, it's a different time. Like when I met him, I was like, you guys, I'm in my early 20s. Oh, Mr. Allen, you play with the former. 
I'm, I'm playing trumpet. I'm going to play his vibe. That it's just just different. He was uh, and is an incredibly serious and focused artist, which is great. But he also came in in a generation where I am the first, you know, and, and there's a pride with that. And um, he wanted to fit in though when he got in. So he didn't want to make a lot of noise. I'm just a violinist. Like the phrase colorblind. Oh, I am just, I don't see color. Well, part of the, the insipidusness of that type of racism inside that phrase colorblind is that you don't see yourself. You accept that people don't see you and you don't see yourself. So the things that you might need that your community might need uh, are suppressed so that you can just get along. Um, so that's, that's I think, some reactions to that question. Um, and then, uh, is it Alora asks about, uh, when have you seen, wait, what have you seen be successful in facilitating discussions on discrimination? And how have you seen people react to these discussions? Okay. Uh, so what I mentioned at the beginning, if you have empathy for people and you realize how hard this is, you realize they're in the matrix, you know, uh, it's, it's, at least for me, it, it makes me empathetic. I understand. And, and it makes me figure out, okay, how do I um, help or can I, in some cases I can't, but it, can I help this person see that in the circles that I run in, because unlike uh, your last guest with uh, the cadet, uh, Jerry Lynn, Jerry, yeah, yeah, I, I actually feel I'm in the, I'm inside the field, like I am in, I'm. She was working with Black Pearl outside. I'm in it. I know all the CEOs. They all know me. It's it's a thing. Even though I, my job is at Juilliard running the jazz program, I feel very very much accepted, embraced, and and empowered in the orchestral field. And that happened over many, many years. I've been on the board of the league for 18 years. That's a long time. Frankly, that's too long. But uh, it's been long enough for people to get to know me and to be comfortable with me, to see me in many different leadership roles, running the audit committee, the chair of the finance committee, going to their concerts. I, I, there are like seven CEOs of orchestras that I went to Juilliard with that we played with. So there's a, there's a comfort level. Aaron knows the music. He's not going to go rogue and insult anybody. He's, you know, he's not militant. He's smart. He, so I can tell that there's all of these things certain people needed to, to know first to then go, Aaron, what do you think about this? How do we address this? But even in that wonderful organization, which I love, that statement that we put out and all of that wouldn't have happened except for COVID and George Floyd. So timing is very important and um, a fit. What's the fit? You know, DBR and I always talk about, or I joke with him that uh, Daniel Romain is, is like, he, he's often in many times like Malcolm X and I'm like Dr. King. <laughs> but he's very activist and very direct and I tend to be like, well, let's see how we can move this along, you know. And he he corrects me that the the roles reverse sometimes too, but finding what your personality is and and if it fits the situation, um, is is a something you have to stay open to. Um, Aaron, I want to kind of go a deeper in this is this thread because uh, I think this is a really important skill that uh, our students will encounter perhaps in their first uh, volunteer position as a board member of a nonprofit uh, organization, where they will encounter a person who might be less progressive or not awakened yet, haven't taken the red pill. Um, but this ability to have that open co communication line, because I think in, in our current political spectrum, it's so easy for us to be in our uh, pers perspective silos, where uh, because people are so used to their own um, uh, in, in, you know, uh, whether it be they're just watching Fox News or we're just watching NPR, uh, that that conversation with somebody who's different ha holds a different opinion than your own. I think this is a skill that we we don't get to practice 
So I, I was always struck by how in, uh, all these webinars that you have run uh, in the in the summer, uh, in talking to uh, other board members, other people from the field, how you are able to sort of have a conversation in a way that would turn a person who sort of begins the meeting saying, why are we doing, why are we talking about this? Why is this, why is this an issue? And then that person by the end of the 60 minute or 90 minutes has, you know what, th this really is a problem. So I was always struck by how you were able to uh, steer the conversation um, in, in that way to have, to keep that line of communication open. So can you, can you talk to our, our students about what are some of the strategies that you have to employ in order to, in order to make that communication line not be severed? Um, uh, that made me think of something. So I have a son who's 19 years old. He's a sophomore in college. And um, a couple of years ago, he was going through some, what as a parent, I would call some challenges. He might call some explorations. And uh, in, in that work, um, I was very frustrated because I had a certain, certain thing I thought was best for him, certain way of behaving. And he had a different view. And um, I had some wise counsel um, from several people, including my dad at the time, who said, uh, what is your goal? What's your long-term goal with this relationship? And I said, well, I'm trying to get him to do this and I want him, you know, he's, this is hurting him, it's not good for him and he did it. He said, what is your goal? Is your goal for him to do exactly what you want to do? Or is your goal to have a relationship? Hmm. And once I realized, whoa, I hadn't thought that far. I was only thinking like the thing I wanted right now. But when he said relationship, I knew he meant, do you even want your son to ever talk to you again? 10 years from now, do you want him to want to talk to you or not? And that's a much longer term game, right? So once I heard that, I was like, well, obviously I want, I want a relationship with, I love my son. I want a relationship with him. He said, so why don't you behave with that long range goal in mind? And that changed everything for me with him. And so similarly, uh, there were many times on the league, which I love that I was ready to quit. Seven, eight years ago, we were doing a strategic plan. I saw diversity put on the list as one of the considerations. Do we talk about diversity? And then I saw it slowly go down, down, and then off the screen. And I thought, oh my goodness, after all this talking, this is, man, this is, I should just leave. And similarly, I said, what's the, what's the goal? To get this one strategic plan to have this on here or to have this culture change within the organization to embrace this? And if it's the latter, you not being here is not gonna help that. So why don't you shut up, approve the plan that they're willing to approve at this point in time and stay in the game. I had no idea what would happen two years ago when I walked into a meeting that I purposely avoided for six years, the equity, diversity, and inclusion committee. I didn't want anything to do with that um, for obvious reasons, maybe obvious. And when I walked in and I heard the discussion and the quality of the discussion, I said, oh my gosh, they're ready. We actually might be able to do something. What if I had quit eight years ago? So I think um, the strategy is the first an internal one. What are your goals? What are you trying to, how are you trying to interact with people? And they, you know, and I think your good home training, you guys are all intelligent. You know how to work hard. You deserve to be at Cornell. You're at a fine institution. Um, you may not know your future, none of us do, but you, you know how to study, you know how to work, you know how to behave. Man, that's it right there. And seek out those conversations. Seek out those conversations. I have one night right now with someone I went to high school but who has a, let's just say, very different political perspective than I do. But I love getting on their thread to read the articles that they're reading. Like, who are you listening to? What are you reading? What do you think about this? And my goal is to keep the conversation going so that I can learn more. Like, how do you think that way? So I think if we bring that to the, whatever those things are called, values, good home training, um, and a purpose, 
a goal you want to impact, it'll be fine. Be open to it and God will provide you the opportunities. I'm I'm 100% sure of that. Does that help answer your question, the question a little bit? Okay. Um, man, I want to do a good job and get through all these questions. All right. Um, so uh, another question was around uh, how does this, oh, the locker room culture in the article, how does it contribute to anti BIPOC discrimination and how can something as deep seated as culture within orchestras be addressed in the near future, given that diversifying staff and reassessing audition pr processes can take time? That's a great question. Um, uh, so many things to say to that. Um, the way that locker room culture contributes, quote unquote, locker room culture, everything has a culture. This class has a culture, even on Zoom, his has a new culture. Um, and it has an impact on how comfortable people feel, whether they say anything or not, you know? And for example, the first time I played with the New York Philharmonic, um, uh, the principal trumpet heard me play at something. He was like, give me your number. He called me up to play. Uh, we did these rehearsals with uh, Charles Dutrois. And I was like in heaven, like, man, I got to play. I'm getting to play with these people. This is amazing. So we get to the evening concert and I walk into the brass room. Like there's a room, maybe uh, what it's now Geffen Hall. And I walk in and uh, I have my bag with my tuxedo on it, my horn. And, and they point to the locker for the you know substitute musicians who are playing in extras in the orchestra. So I go start to set up and I see all my heroes, and Jerome Ashby and Joe Alessi and Phil Smith. And, and I'm putting on my tuxedo and as I'm putting it on facing the locker, I start to hear this laughter start to build behind me. And I wanna join in with what everybody's laughing about. And I turn around and everybody's looking at me and they're laughing. And I'm looking like, what did I do? And uh, Phil Smith, principal trumpet player who got hired me, walks over and says, puts his arm around me and says, uh, we play with tails. Wow. And then the people were laughing going, man, you've never heard, you've never seen us play before? And I'm, and I'm like, well, of course, the reality is, of course, I've seen them play, but I can only afford the seats in the very, very back. And I don't see, and oftentimes I had to get free tickets to the second half when they're already seated. And I didn't, I just, I didn't know. Luckily, Phil said, I went very slow, like a very disappointed father, goes to a locker and pulls out an extra gear, tails and gives it to me. But one thing that really hurt was Jerome Ashby, who's a, a associate principal French horn, the only black musician in the band, who was also teaching at Juilliard and I had seen in the hall, he, he stayed on the other side of the room laughing. Now in their culture, they may have thought that was a way of welcoming me into the culture, like a fraternity hazing. We played the concert, everybody was cool, I played. But to me, I was crushed, crushed. So I think locker room culture can have a lot of impact. And what we can do is, is enliven that culture with our own culture, ourselves, instead of hiding it, whatever that is to you, you know, uh, and it will make people uncomfortable, even if you don't intend to. They didn't intend to hurt me. They hired me for it. They hired me back. That's fine. But they didn't intend to. And I could never tell them that at the time, you know, 20 years old, like, I'm just glad, glad to be in the room. But I think putting our culture, our perspectives out there without fear will eventually make the culture malleable to accept more people. You know, uh, there's a young lady who, who wears a shirt uh, in jazz circles because there's a big gender issue in jazz, not, not enough women women power, you know, women swing, like a lot of, of, of uh, her clothes have this message clearly communicated. I'm a woman in jazz, women power, women, women, women. And initially, I remember thinking like, man, that's abrasive. Why do you have to keep attacking me with this <laughs> constantly? And then I thought to myself, man, that's what's wrong with me. The reason she's doing that is because the world is attacking her. So, you know, 
culture is 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 critical. And as I said before, it's not an either or or uh, strategy. It's an and strategy. How we, can we educate ourselves? Watch a podcast. Listen to a person whose political differences are different than you. Ask a question that no one has asked. You know, and not be afraid of the room getting silent. Just ask. Yeah, I just asked a question. I think as we push, it'll become more uh, open for others. Um, and then uh, Sila's question was, why do you think other industries such as sports uh, are more open to change when it comes to racial integration than classical music? And how can we use examples from those industries as a model to improve? First of all, we should. I mentioned the Rooney rule. There's several other things I can go into, but uh, we should, and that's a sign of the weakness of our industry, the weakness in terms of belief in the music and love of music. If you really love something, you're going to do anything you can <laughs> to support that. You're going to ask anybody. You're not going to be like, well, I can only ask the people who look like me. Because you know, there's a certain, no, I, I love this thing. Or I want to get the right food to my baby. Or I want to help. So you're going to look. But classical music, we're not like that. We're Because we're comfortable. We have our hall. We have our four or five old white donors who keep giving money every year. Why should we look for any more? Um, so to me, I look at uh, capitalism, the fact that most of these other industries are, are clearly motivated by something that uh, sadly is, demonstrates often more power than our love of the art. You know, I hate to admit that, but that's sometimes what it is. Look at pop music, the denigration of women, the level of that, the unabashed a level of denigrating the, the minds and the spirit and the body of women and people buy it up, right? And you all know about it, WAP. Like, okay, like, all right, why are we talking about that <laughs> and not talking about something on a higher level? It is very, very powerful. But I, my reaction to that is our love of, in this case, the arts and classical music has to be as intense as unrelenting and as serious, that means we, we should steal ideas from everybody to make this music available to everybody. You know, look at basketball courts. In 1932, there were no basketball court, courts. You can't go to any city in America, any town of any size and not find a basketball court. Why is that? <laughs> this is before the NBA became big. Like, why is there a basketball court everywhere? Somehow somebody lobbied to get this a part of the nation. And that happens in good ways and bad ways. So I think it's, it's I'm open to learn from any industry. And I, part of the article was to encourage that. Uh, okay, so far, I'm not doing a great job of zipping through this, but the next section is the league statement itself, which is about process. I, most of the questions are kind of, how did you do this? How did this happen? What was the resistance? Um, so I'll quickly say that, um, as I said earlier, the culture was, was right, was much better than nine years ago. People were willing to talk about it. That's because of the people who were in the room. That's because of the world as it, as it is. It was also because of one human story um, that was not about race, that got everybody to understand, which is a beautiful story. The previous chair of this committee, a good friend of mine, Principal Persunas in the New Jersey Symphony, told a story about when the New York City police chief, this is about three years ago or so, when he was, uh, he was going to leave his post, but he had a press conference where he announced an, a formal apology for the treatment of people at Stonewall. Uh, now, this is obviously, if you don't know about Stonewall in New York, a major event of, around civil rights for the, the gay and lesbian community at the time. And the attack, the police came in and bashed and beat up all these innocent folks. It was horrible. But it, the fact that the New York City police chief stood up there and apologized for it was so moving to Bob, uh, who was in California as a kid at that time, a teenager, that he was just talking about how important an apology is, even if, if it just how, the impact of that to him as a gay man. And it was so impactful in the room that people said, well, why don't we do the same thing around racial discrimination in our field? 
And I went home and I was so inspired by his story, I wrote a draft of the statement. I took people at their word. So I wrote a statement and I sent it out to everyone. That was on December, December 19th, 2019. Hmm. Eight months later, various versions, several meetings, what you all read is what came out. Now the path to get the board to unanimously agree upon this was a bit of a journey. <laughs> And there were a lot of interesting bumps and things along the way. But the bottom line is, uh, when someone asked me, how did you do this as a chair to get a committee to approve it, get the board to approve it? And I said, um, I invited um, everybody at every step of the way to be honest. If they didn't feel comfortable, tell me why. Let's talk about it. In fact, the day we were supposed to approve it, uh, I had sent it out to everyone. The committee had approved it. Now the full board was reviewing it in the second meeting after reviewing it the first time. And I said, okay, are there any questions? And two Asian colleagues of ours said, wait, I have a problem with this statement. It, should it doesn't talk about Asians. Now, one of them admitted having, having not read the statement, which was sent the week before until the meeting, in the midst of the meeting. Um, another hadn't been to the first meeting where we had discussed it and also hadn't read the statement at all and just heard the conversation. So in that moment, I had a decision to make as a chair with the 50 member board, uh, all on Zoom like this. <laughs> what are you gonna do? And I said, well, um, it's important that we all have our opinions heard. Um, so let's take some time to hear exactly what the concerns are. And they spread, well, the Asians aren't represented in this and I think it's a missed opportunity. And then another board member who had been at all the meetings and read things and had approved it was like, you know, that's that's right. We should probably have some, some Asians represented. And maybe we should also open it up to Latinx and we should also talk about Native Americans. And we should also talk about this. And so at that moment, I said, you know what? I think if you don't mind, full board, we're going to um, table this decision today. But I promise that I will get back to you in the within the next week with a revision that honors our colleagues' concerns if I may have that permission to table this. You should have seen the looks of the committee, the, the EDI committee, man, they were pissed. <laughs> they were like, what? <laughs> After all this work, I said, uh, everybody's gotta be cool with this if they're not. And so then as soon as we got off the meeting, I called those four people up and had an hour and a half conversation with each of them and went through chapter and verse of, of everything. I rewrote the statement to align with what they had said and I promised them I would do that. Hung up with them, I rewrote it. And uh, I said, can we talk in two days? I'll send it to you. Two days later, after they've gotten the revision, the two Asian colleagues said, we were wrong. You honored what we said, but now we realize this dilutes the power of this. And as long as the field is committed to addressing the unique perspective of Asian and Asian Americans in classical music through a similar level of detail, an article, a discussion, uh, if you would as the chair commit to that, and as long as we know that that will happen, we think it's better to not dilute the power of the statement and the article by piling on a bunch of other uh, ethnicities in a tokenized way. We were wrong. Adding it there is just is tokenism. Could you go back to the original version? And I said, I can't go back to the original version to the full board unless you're comfortable to say what you just said, because it'll appear that I wasn't listening to you. So they both wrote separate emails to the entire board saying everything they just said, I just said, and begged people to unanimously approve it as written. So the, the lesson to me there is that the ability to have clarity like with my son, I want a relationship in 10 years. I wanted this board to approve, to feel whatever was written that they full heartedly supported it because it's going to take work to implement. A lot of work. I do not, it's not going to sit on any shelf as long as I have breath. And so because of that clarity, we got there. I hope that answers some of the questions I read about that people wanted to ask about the leak statement. Any, any follow-up? I know we're running close on time. Yeah, but I, I, hopefully I haven't bored everyone. Okay, so um, the audition process. 
So with um, a lot of questions about the audition process, DBR's idea of you know having it be an open process and does that bring in bias? Um, would public auditions harm the integrity if the playing is based solely on technique and skill? Um, you know, and then the, the nepotism that can go on, which by the way, the, you know, as I mentioned in the article, the nepotism and, and favoritism is why people started talking about blind auditions in the first place, because people's girlfriends and boyfriends and friends and students were only getting hired. So uh, what I'll say on this topic is that it is clearly the issue, the, the biggest structural policy-based issue that this field should address um, and to help solve this problem of the lack of diversity in the, in the institution, at least in, on the stage. Um, and so the field knows that and the field working with the, the unions, so is beginning to work with the unions and set up an opportunity to do that, to really to discuss it. There are many different opinions, which I believe all need to be heard and discussed. Um, and uh, our, my job is to be a facilitator, make sure that we, we come together to do that work and not hide from it, not hide from our prejudices of, I won this job in 1983, I went through all this pain and suffering, I want anyone else who comes to my orchestra to go through the same pain and suffering and hazing that I did. That's an opinion, that's a human reaction. I suffered, why can't you suffer? <laughs> Another perspective is the blind, the, uh, first of all, it's not blind. It's the phrase blind audition implies that it's blind from the beginning to the end. That does not happen except for one orchestra, which no longer is working, which is the Met Opera. So first of all, it's a lie. Second of all, um, the audition does not mirror the job in many, many ways. There are aspects of playing an orchestra that are not addressed at all in the current audition process. And third, the audition process, as it states, is not um, individualized enough to each orchestra. Every orchestra from a community, you know, community orchestra to, uh, you know, a small regional orchestra that has three concerts a year to the Boston Symphony to the what everyone thinks they should have the same type of process, which is insane. The, the job and the commitment is completely different. The degree of interaction with the public and the, it's just it's completely different and so the lack of ability of the field to form an evaluative process that mirrors the needs of the organization is something i believe needs to be addressed okay At, and then um finally as someone who shares uh an evaluative process of over 300 applicants to juilliard every year to our program um I know how easy this is to design an audition process that aligns with the values of the organization and is completely equitable and open. And um, I've seen a transformation in our little world of Juilliard Jazz in five years. Um, we have the most diverse program period in the country, women, Asians, Latin Americans, domestic, international, poor, rich, it's uh, and that's it is by design. So I am prejudiced because I think I've, I've seen how you could do it. So just do it. And if, to the extent the field doesn't do it, it says to me every day, you don't want us here. You don't want that transgender musician in your orchestra. You don't want that person here. Because you're not trying to get it to happen. All right. So um, I, what, we, what can we do? A lot of questions about what can we do as Cornell students to help this issue. Um, I, we've said it a few times already today. The fact that you, to the extent that you even care to become aware of this, let alone the readings you've done, um, uh, to develop your own thinking is huge. And the next thing to do is to continue that and then to share that. Do not hide that. Share it, engage people in conversation. What do you think about this? Hey, teacher who teaches me this wonderful instrument and plays in this great orchestra, what are you all doing about diversity? Why are you asking me that? We're doing the Brahms Sonata today. We're not talking about that because I'm taking a class on it and I'm curious how you think about it. 
So I think doing that is one thing where you're in school. When you get out, realize you will be put in situations because you're smart, you're educated, you're going to Cornell. Shoot, who doesn't want to be in a room with you? And you're going to be put in situations of power sooner than you realize. Very soon. And so your job is just to get ready for that. You don't know what it is. I know that feeling. I remember some old guy telling me the same thing. Man, you're going to be in a great position. I was like, yeah, man, I just want to eat. You know, I don't, I don't know, whatever. But I remember 23 being asked to speak to Congress. And I remember, man, I'm from South Central. You want me to speak to Congress? Yeah, we're trying to do studies on what artists' lives are like. And Ted Kennedy was sitting up on the dial. I just couldn't, I was like, man, that blew me away. Like I'm actually here. So my advice to you is just get ready. Get ready, it's going to come. All right, I'm gonna stop talking. So um, I think on that note, we're out of time. So I think uh, what I would love to do is uh, thank, thank uh, Mr. Flagg uh, for uh, his sage advice and, and giving us all of these uh, uh, challenges. Uh, I also want to take a group picture, um, not only for our attendance, but uh, just so we can let the world know this, this, is, this is happening. So uh, everybody, uh, screens on, please. I'll take three as usual. Here we go. One, two. No, hang on. <laughs> I got to stop recording. <laughs>